Hi, I'm Ms. Burling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at LAM Research with David Freed, who's going to talk today about process window optimization. David, as we move down into the more advanced nodes, the processes get more complicated. There's more variation. How do we deal with this? So you're right. As the technologies scale and the process flows get more complex, we have more variations, and those variations inter interact with each other in more complex ways. It becomes a nightmare to try to manage this and try to optimize technology. So what do we do about it? How do you address this? Uh, one of the key techniques is called process window optimization. It's actually a very interesting technology, and it, there's a lot of work going on in the industry right now. Um, I could try to explain it on the board here. Yeah, why don't you draw this out for us? Okay. So David, what are we looking at here? Well, what I've drawn here is just a very simple two-dimensional space of what we call process inputs, or parameters of the, the fabrication process. And each of these parameters obviously has variation. So if you think about, there's sort of a cloud of process behaviors that will be applied across these two different parameters to all the, all the wafers and all the chips that you're producing in the fab. Again, this is a two-dimensional experiment. In reality, as the processes get more complex, there's many, many process inputs. And so this cloud becomes an n-dimensional space. With lots of interactions between the different pieces, right? Absolutely. Now, each of those processes interact with each other. Each of the variations re react with each other. And what it ends up producing is another space of, I'll say, device results. Now again, I've drawn this simply in two dimensions. Uh, it would be a different m-dimensional space depending on how many different device specifications we're trying to hit. Um, a cloud of input pa parameters will produce a cloud of device results. If you went back to, say, 90 nanometers, would this be a lot simpler than it is here? Absolutely. The number of processes in a 90 nanometer technology is smaller. The variations are smaller uh, percentages of the nominal dimensions. And so the cloud is smaller in dimensionality, but also smaller in its impact. Also, in older technology generations, we had fewer device specifications we were trying to hit. As technologies get more and more complicated, the number of specs we try to hit grows. So this becomes a larger and larger dimensional space on both sides. And it's not just one type of processor that's being made anymore, right? Now you have completely new architectures that are coming out for things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Absolutely. So the different type of product that you're trying to produce really sets what specs you're trying to hit over here. And you may want to be in a different space in the device results depending on the product. So if you choose based on your product that you want your device results to end up in maybe this region of the cloud, again, I'm drawing this in simple two dimensions, you have to figure out what process inputs do I want to set to land as many results as possible over here? Again, as this has become a, a very highly dimensional problem, that becomes very difficult. Is that a function of yield, is, or does that determine yield? Absolutely. Uh, the specifications are the limits in the device results where uh, either performance is optimized or yield is optimized, or hopefully both. So. This mapping of input process parameters to output device results, you can generate a significant amount of data by running wafers, okay, from input to output. The difficult part is taking that data and re-engineering the target process input in order to hit that output. This requires some very complex machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence type techniques to understand how this space can map back into a target process space that may be very oddly shaped here, but allows you to optimize your process. This act and this computation is called process window optimization. And what you're doing here is instead of taking individual bits of data, what you're doing is putting the, 
together a pattern of behavior that goes from one to the next. It's a way of increasing the density of that data more or less, right? Absolutely. So you can do this by running wafers and generating a one-for-one -one mapping between these spaces, or you can use predictive modeling to generate a much, much higher density in the translation between these two. So by using predictive modeling, you can really fill the space out, really blanket the, the translation, and have a better confidence that your backwards calculation puts you in the right space. So what's the upshot of this? What's the benefit for both the fab as well as the company that's developing the chip? Oh, the benefit's really simple. If I know the space where I want the input parameters to land or to behave, I can tighten the specifications, I can retarget the processes to be in this region, and I can guarantee a larger percentage of my output chips land in the target output range. So this is just as simple as optimizing the input process to land as, as high yield or as high performance as possible. One thing that we've seen going on on a regular basis now is increasing the number of respins in order to get to that place, right? Does this help cut down the respins? Absolutely. And any computational technique or virtual technique at process window optimization cuts down on the number of wafers you need to run to generate these patterns and probably the number of uh, mask respins to hit the targets. The process inputs could be thought of as design inputs as well because of course the design differences or OPC differences will have direct result in where the resulting products land in, in the device space. This is not easy stuff though. What do you have to keep in mind? What kind of skill sets do you need that you didn't have before? Okay, so whereas we've always had high execution of running wafers, measuring wafers, and analyzing the output results, this requires uh, a bunch of different disciplines to manage the data, to, to use big data in a high-speed uh, computational environment, to use analytics and machine learning, deep learning and artificial intelligence to do this backwards calculation through the space, and then, again, process engineering to dial in the input parameters. So you're layering on both domain expertise as well as uh, data science too, right? Absolutely. So data science, uh, artificial intelligence is becoming part and parcel of technology development and process development right now. We've really smashed those two worlds together, and we're starting to see very positive impact from it. If you get this right, does it improve your yield? Does it improve the, uh, the quality of the wafer or the chips on that, that wafer? So absolutely. If you think about a, a product where you've got this mapping built, you can optimize. But also, if you're able to do this predictively, you can design the technology ahead of time to be more successful when you run product. So this approach can be used in R&D and pathfinding to develop technology, but also long into high volume manufacturing to optimize yield and to increase profit. Why hasn't this been done before? Was it not necessary? It has become more necessary as technology has scaled and the challenges have grown, but also the computational techniques to do this have really just become uh, standards in machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence. And so, uh, the, the techniques you know, in artificial intelligence have really arisen at the right time to meet the need of the complex integration flows. So what comes next? Where can we take this? Honestly, I think this is absolutely essential to all of these advanced technology nodes that we're talking about. Uh, gate all around, CFET, vertical devices. If those are ever going to work in manufacturing, if we're ever going to yield those at high levels for profit, uh, for scale gen technology generations, that's what comes next out of this, is these technologies will be realized and we will have scale technology dimensions in the future. David, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much for having me.